how many black women from public housing have you talked to? I would probably say under five. I have trouble even finding them as I tour the world. It's very classes of who gets to be a musician. It's also very expensive, you know? So people that come from my upbringing don't really get a chance to perform, you know? It's mostly men, like hip hop guys. I grew up poor, they get a chance, but not the women, you know? Uh, the community is very important because we're not separate from the community as an artist, you know? Um, oh, that's my hair. Um, you know, I feel like it's important for artists to not only speak about the things that are happening in their community, but also to be a part of the envisioning of the future of that community. Well, um, a lot of the stuff that I organize in the community to start off my like life of organi organizing was a show called Rockers, and it was a, a platform for uh, musicians, mainly musicians that could not get uh, a chance to perform in the other venues in the city, you know? So it was me taking it into our own hands of saying, hey, we're musicians, we want to play somewhere, but uh, we have to create our own platform. You know, so a lot of that, a lot of the stuff that I was creating was out of necessity because we had to create it, you know. We're Black Quantum Futurism and we uh, created a, an idea that we were able to get funding from uh, Blade of Grass um, in New York and it was the pro one of the projects. We have many projects that we have done, but one of the projects was the Community Futures Lab. My partner here does a lot of work with housing in Philadelphia, so um, we're thinking of, we're always thinking of innovative ways that we can be more part of the community that we draw from, from the community that we live from, you know, live in. It's not something that I'm directly putting myself in, you know, it's, I don't separate art from life. You know, this is this is my life, and I make art. You know what I mean? And it's a, it's not something that I'm like, oh, I need to do something like this, or I need to do. It's very natural, the process of how it comes out. It comes out of our shared general uh, interests. I love basketball. You know, like uh, my partner here, you know, uh, works in housing. You know, that's something that I care about. That's something that we both care about. So it's not like we're trying to find things to do. It's all very natural. So I'm a housing attorney. Um, I work at a nonprofit in Philadelphia called Community Legal Services. Um, and we serve low-income Philadelphians and provide free legal services to them. And I represent people who are facing loss of their housing through eviction um, or displacement or, or other things. Um, so that's that's some of the work we do with them. I mean, it's a huge problem. It's, it's a problem happening all over the world, honestly. Um, in Phil Philadelphia, it's particularly pronounced. Philadelphia is the largest, poorest city in the United States. Um, and so the housing crisis is very pronounced there. Um, because there's so many poor people um, and, and low income and jobless people. Um, and then there's a very serious lack of affordable housing. Um, so all of those things combined creates this really huge crisis, um, mostly for low income people. But it's an issue that's affecting all communities because when you have um, a lot of poor people being displaced, that affects entire communities, um, not just the people who are being displaced. Um, it destabilizes communities, it invites blight, it invites stretchification, it invites all of these things that disrupts um, stable communities. So. It's not separate. It's just a, uh, it's a mirror, you know. What's happening on the local level is happening all over the world. And that's what we're, you know, many people are starting to find out when they're traveling. They're like, oh, the world is a ghetto. You know, the world is suffering. It's not just people in my block, you know? 
And I don't believe that it's a thing about new problems. It's the same problem cycling. I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, I think that's the reason why I'm traveling all over the world. That's why someone that grew up in Maryland is going to Finland. You know what I mean? It's because like there's common commonalities, there's common ground that we share, you know? And I feel like, of course, from your perspective, it's hard to say, oh, I, I don't have any, or not hard, but it's easy to say, oh, I don't have any connection with black people. That's something that you're dealing with or something, you know? But there's black people all over the world, like everyone. There's, there's women getting, there's women suffering all over the world. So it's kind of like, it's not a surprise. Before I was surprised, but now I'm like, okay, it all makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just like you said, I mean, the, the old linear temporal notion of time moving forward on a line and coming to some chaotic end that we have no control over is, I, I think, it doesn't remain valid for most people or for a lot of people. A lot of people don't experience life um, in that way. Um, and some, that's just what we investigate in our work. It's like, how do we shift that and how do we... Um, think about other ways of experiencing time that are more beneficial to oppressed people because we see the linear time model as being used as, an, as a way to punish poor people and oppressed people and keep them in these narrow temporal bands where they can't plan for their future or they can't access their past um, or have any control over their, their own narratives um, of either the future or the past. Um, and yeah, and so when we talk about how other people experience time, um, and other communities experience time. One way of experiencing time is not non-linear ways, is a cyclical way. And sometimes those cycles can be um, negative cycles that people find themselves in, but there's also positive cycles um, and positive ways of experiencing time in, in non-linear ways. So that's just what we ex explore in our work through music, through literature, through workshops, through all, all sorts of methods. I mean, it's exactly that. It's like realizing that time is not fatal. It's like time is not fatalistic and things don't have to end in this, this way that, you know. So if we, if we look at time as something that cycles around, then it makes much more sense that we take steps backwards or that, you know, there's a negative downswing to the cycle and then at some point there's going to be an upswing, but not, you know. So I, I think, yes, seeing time thinking about these alternative ways of experiencing time does help to um, grapple with the fact that not everything is going to be on this linear success, you know, or end in this way. It, there is no end. Like, basically, things cycle around, and if you learn how to deal with that cycle and, and how to prepare for the next season, um, you know, it, it, it helps. It, it makes things a little bit better and hopeful, for at least for me. Um, it makes things more dynamic. Um, and, and you can think about relationships and the dynamis, dynamicism of relationships versus like systems and how, you know, how all little things. I don't know. Yeah, it, it helps. Mm. No, I, I'm not, I'm not forcing it. It's, a, it's like a time capsule of sounds that I love and that are important to me, you know? I mean, there's some moments where I'm like, like in the creation of poem, I added a lot of uh, wild uh, dogs barking. I, you know, sampled a lot of wild dogs. But I chose that because I was creating a soundscape that was uh, the creation myth of how the world created was created, you know? So sometimes it's in a thing like that where I'm like, okay, how did the world become? Let me do that sonically. Or and then there's, I make collages where it's just stuff that I love. I don't want to forget it, you know? I like to manipulate the sounds to make them work. I just can't say, oh, I love this. I'm gonna throw it in a song. You have to make it fit into the song. So you do a lot of manipulation, you know?
I got into electronics because I was in love with synthesizers. So that's why I like synthesizers more than I like electronic music. If that makes sense. I have my own Derman that I play with, and I have three Mother 32s that I play with, but everything else was not mine. My stuff was in the back. They didn't have a mixer for me, so I had to do 100% improv versus what I had planned. It was stressful. It was stressful. <laughs> well, my 45-minute concert is totally different than what you saw yesterday. So, um, and for my durationals, I don't care about the audience. I mean, I'm never thinking about them. I barely even look at them. They're just there. I'd rather have it closed off, you know, and just like, because to me, it's all about putting sound out into the world to change something as an act of protection, not for some performance in front of somebody. I, I make them up. I just made them up. In the moment? Yeah. And do they make sense to you? <laughs> they better make sense. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. Some things, I get signals from somewhere and I'm talking about this all of a sudden, or I'm saying this, you know? Or if I hear somebody talking, I would say that. If I quiet everything down, I hear people talking, I do not, that pisses me off. So I just turn everything loud. So I would say that's how the, in, the audience influences me. They piss me off and then I just make more noise because I don't want to hear them. No, I mean, I feel like all the practice that I've been doing, all the practice, all the things that I read, my whole life prepares me to perform and make up stuff, you know? I'm collecting all the information. So it's, it's more like a living thing that prepares me to improv, you know? I still do the same things I've always done. I coach basketball, you know? I love that. I love working with kids. That's just like what I do, you know? What kind of jobs my parents did, all kinds of jobs. My mom was a nurse, she works in, um, what is it called, social work, uh, all kinds of stuff. Just like working parents, you know, both of my parents always had two jobs each growing up. They always kept a job. My next solo record that I do, that is going to be the record to define me. Everything else is old. You know, like Fetish Bones was already two years old before I even released it. You know, there's only about uh, three new songs on that album. You know, the next album was done in two weeks and made it up right there in my room, you know? So this next solo album will be like everything, you know? It will be the real, the real, you know, thing. It would be, it would sound like fetish bones, most definitely, but harder. Oh yeah, I talk, always talk about my life. Oh, I don't got anything else to talk about. I'm not part of Hollywood or anything. <laughs> you know, I got just a real, you know, I'm just speaking my truth. I got so much to say, you know. So anyone I've ever collaborated with, there will be albums with them, you know? I don't like to waste time. I don't like to, you know? If I'm gonna meet up with you and we're gonna do, play around with music, we're making a fucking album. So I try to stay in the house and work on my own music, because every time I meet up with someone, it's like, oh man, I gotta make another album with you. Yeah, I got all the collaborative albums done. Every single one is done. Okay. So now I'm fresh. I got a jazz album, uh, two rap albums, and then I'm done. And then it's all me, you know? It was gonna come out this year, but because I've already done, made four albums this year, I think that's enough. And then so I'll start fresh for the next, next year. 
but early next year it'll be route.